Welcome back to another video this is a part 10 of. What if Issei fell in love with Sona after Rias broke his heart? I don't really want to drag out the intro so let's get started. Chapter 37, Sona's Chance, a high school DxD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 37, The Mantra of Sona, Scene Anime Convention, Kyoto. Next to the elevators were a pair of doors that led to the emergency staircase. Sitting on these stairs were both Sona and Issei. Earlier, Issei covertly asked if the two could get some privacy as Sona agreed with no issues whatsoever. Both have been sitting on the steps for a few minutes now, completely in silence. Sona had a concerned look as her head was facing her indifferent looking boyfriend as he just looked toward the emergency doors. Issei, what's going on? Sona then placed an arm on the teen's shoulder. Twitching from the sudden touch, Issei turns his head and gives eye contact to Sona. A few things are on my mind right now, some things hit rather close to home when I was with that governor. Also, after this night, we only have one more, then, I have to go back to Kuo. It's been this strange and wild ride, almost like something from a fairy tale or a fantasy manga. Sona nods while slightly squeezing Issei's shoulder in support. I am guessing Azazel went into more detail regarding her. Also, the way your voice changed suddenly, the moment you said, Kuo, Issei, you're worrying about Rias aren't you? Issei nods while turning his head back toward the exit doors as he is trying to hold in his rational and irrational fear with great difficulty. I um, I need to confront her about some things. Widening her eyes, Sona notions for the team to continue. Right now, when I think about her, all I can feel is this monstrous entitlement, a heartless thing that only wants to be popular, wants to be loved but has none to give back. I feel like I've been played with, Sona. It's like, turning me into a devil, it just feels like a sick joke. And then the peerage, oh man, using one of his hands, Issei wipes a tear that escaped his ducts without permission. I am sure that's not true. I know Rias, you aren't wrong about her being entitled, we can agree on that. But she is a good person, Issei. Even so, I cannot forgive her actions. Regardless of what she wants, you're mine. Sona realized what he had just said and began to blush. Turning his head, Issei looks deeply into Sona's violet eyes. You're right, you were there and you're still here. Sona, the sea tree heiress replies as her blush intensifies. Yes, um, I really need to hug somebody before I completely break down, would it be alright? The teen grits his teeth unsure of her reply. Instantly, Issei's head is pulled into Sona's chest as her arms wrap around the teen very tightly. Don't ever ask me for something that you can have whenever you need, Baka. As Issei lets it all out, Sona uses one of her hands to caress the teen's back. From the hallway that led to the elevators, muffled sounds of crying could be heard. Scene, Gregory. Ah geez, this paperwork has just piled up and piled up. Azazel is standing in a large office room with many cabinets and bookshelves. On his large desk, a mountain's worth of documents and paperwork teetered back and forth. Scratching the back of his head, Azazel yawns and looks toward his wristwatch. Tapping on the screen of this smart device, the governor proceeded to make a video call. Moments later, the call was answered while a pair of familiar women were smiling on the other side of the screen. Ladies, is everything going according to plan? Azazel was now grinning as he spoke into the watch. Mitelp jumped up and down from the other side of the screen. Yeah, he's fine, but Azazel Sama, I dressed up for the convention. Hiding in the shadows like this, well, it makes my costume pointless. Warner then scoffed, quit your complaining already, these conventions are a waste of time. Anyway, don't worry Azazel Sama, we have everything under control. Azazel nods from his side of the call. All right. Good to hear, just make sure you keep yourselves hidden for now. That goes double for when the kid goes back to Kuo. Let me know if he does anything, especially if that anything involves him using that beautiful gear of his. Both girls nod and the call ends. Meanwhile, Azazel looks back at his paperwork as he lights a cigarette. Well shit, work work. Seen Kuo Academy. Bullshit, Graphia, I know for a fact that you have got something to do with all of this. A camel ghost, really? No no no, only a few people know about my dreadful fear of camels, so fess up. Rias was pointing accusingly at Graphia, who was standing near the entrance with a cup of hot tea. 
Graphia then shrugs while showing the slightest of grins. Rias, you're being punished. Stomping her foot onto the ground, Rias places her hands on her hips as her angry face slowly turns red. So, you and my brother came up with this foul idea to torment me. Graphia shrugs once more, short answer, yes, Rias, Rias, as her hair stands on its own, Rias turns behind her all while Graphia is holding in a laugh. Looking directly back at her was this pale skeletonized camel. It was smiling as it managed to lick Rias on her chin. Instantly, Rias screamed, no, we now see our favorite red-headed devil princess, running back outside and toward the orc as her screams fill the whole and empty schoolyard. Scene unknown location, sitting on her large black framed bed while under the pink covers, Ophis continues to watch the floating purple and black orb. Looking into this sphere of energy, we are treated to a third person view of Issei Hyodo along with Sona Sidri. Ophis tilts her head as she continues to watch this boy cry while the other one seems to comfort him. Comfort, was that the correct word? Ophis wouldn't know from experience therefore she relied purely on observation. There was also, crying, once again, the subject in itself was perplexing for the grey-eyed dragon god. While continuing to watch this interaction play out with great interest, Ophis felt something. Tilting her head the other way, the little girl's usual distant and emotionless face showed an actual frown. What was this? Ophis didn't know. Heck, she didn't even know her lips could move like that, not until now. Touching her lips, Ophis straightened her head as her grey eyes stayed glued to the monitor within the orb. Issei, shish, it's alright. I know this has been strange, really, for everyone involved to be honest, Sona then shook her head and continued. But I have to say, even with the recent, erm, interactions with some other women, well, besides that, I think this trip was good, for us. Sona nods while continuing to rub Issei's back, and like I told you, no matter what Rias does, I got you. Sona's face contorts into a grumpy one, but I think you're right, you should confront her. If anything, it will bring closure. You have my support, okay. Ophis's eyes widen a bit more as she watches Issei nod. Pulling her covers up toward her chest, Ophis proceeds to touch her lips once again as her head tilts slightly. Sure enough, she still had a frown on her face. Scene Anime Convention, Kyoto. Era Era. My, look at everyone all in their best costumes, Kuno, dear. Yasaka was walking from the entrance way as she wore her trademark yellow kimono along with her black sash of skulls. Holding the fox queen's hand was little Kuno, who was smiling brightly. The fox princess was keeping up with the fast yet gracious pace of her mother. She was wearing a pair of jeans and a milky spiral hoodie. Looking up at her mother, Kuno nodded. I know, anime is popular. Mom, I've tried to tell you this for a long time now. Yasaka giggled into her sleeve. Yes, yes, whatever you say, little one. Oh, there he is, I can smell him from here. Come along, sweetheart. Kuno picked up the pace while smiling even brighter than before. Yay, Papa Kuno. As the girls continued to make their way through the crowds of onlookers and cosplayers, Seraphal caught sight of the two and waved them over toward her and her sister's peerage. Seeing this, Yusaka and Kuno redirected their path and headed toward the group. Era Era, good afternoon Sarah Chan. Your outfit is quite adorable I must say. Yusaka shows a warm smile. Oh, you think so? Gee thanks a lot. Seraphal proceeded to spin around in a circle, delightfully. Kuno points toward the magical girl while showing a surprised look. Auntie, is that from the upcoming season? It looks so cute. Seraphal nods while showing a childish smile. Naturally my dear, naturally. I'm so glad you like it. Tsubaki, who is standing next to Seraphal, adjusts her glasses. Ahem, according to the schedule for today, there is supposed to be a luncheon included with our tickets. President Sitri wanted me to remind everyone so that we might eat together. Saji throws a fist into the air while smiling brightly. Food, hell yes, I could totally eat right now. Ruruka nods as her excitement grows along with Saji's. Yes, the western style buffets are quite common at conventions that are located in places like casinos. And the ice cream bars. Momo nods seriously and matter of factly. Steak and lobster, those are pretty common, right? Yasaka tilts her head while placing her index finger toward her chin. Hum, 
I don't think I've eaten outside of my home for at least a decade. Back with, the fox queen stopped herself as her daughter looked back up at her with a worried expression. Now showing a calm smile, Yusaka changed the subject. Oh my, yes, well. Sniff, speaking of, Seraphal, where is my Isekun? Kuno now got excited once again while turning her attention toward the Mao. Papa Kun. Seraphal's cheerful smile turned into a slightly sadder one. Looking behind her now and toward the twin doors that led to the staircase, Seraphal slowly turned back around and had her gaze on Yasaka. He is having a break from all of the excitement. Don't worry, my Satan is with him. Hee <laughs> hee. She keeps him on a tight leash. Yasaka crouched down and picked up Kuno then kissed her on the cheek before placing her in Seraphal's arms. Seraphal looked surprised as did Kuno. Smiling, Yasaka sniffs the air one more time and then politely bows toward Seraphal. Please keep an eye on my daughter for a few minutes. I don't like the idea of leaving her alone in crowded places such as this. Seraphal's surprised look morphed into a slight smirk. Oh. Okay then, gotcha. The Mao Devil then winks cutely as Yasaka begins her way toward the pair of twin doors. Scene, Staircase. As Sona had her arms wrapped tightly around Issei's shoulders, the team continued to lay, now quiet and peacefully, on the Sea Tree Heiress chest. Softly rocking back and forth, the two stayed like this for a bit of time. Can I ask you something? Issei quietly spoke up even though his face was muffled in between Sona's arms and chest. Softening her grip, Sona looked down while nodding. She had a passive yet kind smile. Why do you live, well, like a normal and financially struggling teenager? I mean, you come from a high class family and all. Like, I know Rias is living at my house, but before that, at least in the Orc, she lived quite lavishly. I think Akino prepared all of her food and I remember everything looking so fancy, even the cakes and snacks Kaneko would gobble up on a regular basis. So, yeah, I guess, what I'm trying to ask is why aren't you more? Issei was cut off the moment Sona released one of her arms while placing her finger to the teen's lips. Still smiling, Sona interrupts. Entitled, Issei Hiodo, are you asking me why I don't take advantage of my family's wealth? Still with Sona's finger on his mouth, Issei simply nods. Making a sudden giggle, Sona then continues. It's not that I refuse to accept the power that comes along with my responsibilities, it's more than that. Issei, in the future, I want to create a school. I want it to be a place where everyone is treated equally, regardless of status. I want it to be a place that will take those who are unwanted with open arms. Sona takes a moment while finally removing her finger from the teen's lips. So, I want to lead by example. If I can successfully endure the burdens that come along with budgeting while maintaining all of my duties as both a high-class devil and the student council president, then I know that I won't be asking the impossible from my future students and staff. Sona then took a deep breath. She seemed so passionate just now, Issei couldn't help but marvel at his girlfriend, who continued to surpass his expectations each and every day. Widening his eyes, Issei arms, who were already wrapped around Sona's waist tightened softly. That's a beautiful dream, Sona. A place where everyone, regardless of house, status, wealth, anything, doesn't matter, everyone is equal, yeah, that's really something I could get on board with. None of that master-servant stuff. Sona used her one arm to return the tighter embrace as she smiled warmly. I'm glad you understand, Baka. Chapter 38, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 38, Ophis. Scene, anime convention, Kyoto. Era era, you two are so adorable. Come here and give Mama Yasaka a big squeeze. Still sitting on the emergency staircase steps, Sona and Issei jumped the moment Yasaka appeared from behind the two while proceeding to wrap all nine of her tails around the devils. Now being pushed into both Sona and Yasaka in a forceful manner, Issei struggles against one of the fox queen's large breasts as it threatens to suffocate the boy. Ah. MMMMMPPPHH. Sona is also in a similar position to that of her boyfriend. Wrapped in four of Yusaka's tails, from her shoulders all the way down to her toes, the sea tree heiress had her face completely engulfed in the fox queen's chest. MMMMPPPHHH. Meanwhile, Yusaka smiled brightly as she had both of her hands against her blushing cheeks. Era era, so cute, so precious. 
There is nothing I love more than seeing a pair of lovers, comforting each other. Oh, darling, please stop pulling away from your wife. Yasaka now places one of her hands on the top of Issei's head, holding him in place. Yasaka then looks up toward the staircases with a gleam in her dreamy eyes. Sona Tan, you are just like your sister in so many ways, did you know that? All we are able to see is Sona, attempting to shake her head and mumble incoherent words. MMMPPPHHMPHMMMPPHH. Yes, you are alike indeed. I find it so fitting, that the two you found this gem of a soul, my husband furthermore, you brought him to me. Fate is a very real thing. There is no such thing as coincidence. Era era, oh dear, Sona darling, when you finally marry, please, let me be one of your flower maids. Yusaka smiled brighter as she continued her gaze upward. Sona stopped struggling suddenly, MMMPPH. Yusaka then twitched her fox ears while slowly turning her head downward and now at Sona, who was now allowed a bit of wriggle room. Yes, I said, when you get married, to Issei of course. Sona shows a very nervous and blushy smile. Oh, um, okay. Yusaka nods politely while, slowly releasing the Citri Eris. Afterwards, she uses her remaining tails to cover both of Issei's ears, as he was still in place. I'll even help you plan it out, after all, I am an ordained minister. Well, I am for that of my people, if you don't have an issue with Shinto-style weddings that is. Sona shakes her head, no, I think that would be amazing, Yusaka-sama, thank you. Sona shows a very serious and determined look however her blush remains plastered to her cheeks. Yusaka smiles while now looking back down at her husband as she relaxes her shoulders. Using one of her many tails, she gently uses one to raise Issei's chin to meet her golden eyes. As his ears are finally released from several other tails, Issei looked up at Yusaka with a nervous smile as he was panting for fresh air. What was that all about so, gasp of breath s, so suddenly. Era era, you'll eventually get used to how I treat my husband, Issei-kun. The fox queen was now sporting a deep and red blush against her cheeks. Scene unknown location, sitting on her pink and black themed bed, Ophis was now eating what looked to be Chinese food from a stereotypical takeout container. Cheeks puffed out and with a mouthful of chow mein, the Ouroboros dragon god began to repeat some of the words she was hearing through her viewing orb. Um. Nom nom. I saw she. Gulp I see. Marriage. Husband. Wedding. Ophis tilts her head. Fox yokai. Hum. So, this one and this other one, then, there is that other one. So, the two biblical devil siblings along with the yokai. Are they mates? Ophis takes another furkful of her chow mein while enjoying a large bite. Um. Nom nom. Gulp why is he aggravated about this, Rius, person? Why did the security have water in his eyes? Why did he make those sounds? I don't understand. Ophis tilts her head the other way as her vacant expression remains. I will investigate further. Issei Hiodo, Welch Dragon, you are puzzling. Deciding that her food was becoming boring, Ophis threw the Chinese takeout box into the air. The moment this happened, phantom hands followed with long and black appendages burst from all corners of the room. Without the slightest hint of a single sound, the airborne carton was now erased from reality as each hand met it with lightning-fast reflexes. Seconds later, the appendages vanished back into the walls, ceilings and floor. Scene, Yusaka Castle, three hours later. As the day winded down, the large group of devils, as well as Yusaka and Kuno proceeded to pile out from the large limousine. Everyone looked exhausted from the long day, especially Issei, as he was rubbing his sore shoulders. He couldn't help but smile considering Kuno had such a great time as he gave her a piggyback ride for over an hour straight. Going from booth to kiosk, Issei had the excited fox princess on his shoulders as he would trade hands with Seraphal, Sona and Yasaka in some strange rotation that they must have come up with. Once they enjoyed the convention luncheon, the group continued through the exhibits until their legs couldn't carry them anymore. Shortly after, Yusaka had the family car arrive to pick them up. Before reaching the main entrance, a stretching Issei was instantly tackled by Seraphal. She had both of her arms wrapped around his waist very tightly. Turning his head and looking down, Issei was greeted by Seraphal's large and blue eyes as the Mao was smiling maliciously. Issei-kun, 
After you get situated, you are to report to your Milky Chan. It's the door furthest in the hallway. Seraphal then pulls Issei's nervous face into hers as she whispers the rest. Don't force my hand. If you don't come to my room tonight, I will hunt you down. Seraphal then releases the flustered teen while showing a now. Warm and gentle smile. Okay then. See you then, Issei-kun. Not moving from his position, Issei couldn't help but nervously rub the back of his head. Sona and Yasaka watched this interaction from a distance. As Sona was about to walk toward Issei, Yasaka placed her hand on the Citri heiress's shoulder. Turning her head to meet the Fox Queen's eyes, Yasaka simply shook her head slowly while closing her eyes. Sona got the point in this gesture. She needs to let it be, more so, she needs to accept the idea of sharing her boyfriend. Scene, spare bedroom. Later that evening, Issei was putting on a pair of socks in the guest room he shares with Sona. The Citri heiress was quietly sitting at the desk while reading a philosophy textbook, however, she continued to keep one eye on Issei. Being awkwardly quiet himself, Issei wanted to say something but was afraid it would make things much worse. So once he was finished, he turned his attention toward Sona, who appeared to be rather immersed in her reading then he looked toward the sliding door. Choosing option B, Issei proceeded to quietly make his way out of the bedroom. Hiodo. Sona's voice sounded very cold. It was enough to stop Issei from walking another step, so instead, he turns his head and meets the gaze of his stern-looking girlfriend. About to scream out her thoughts, Sona took a moment to compose herself. Adjusting her glasses, Sona spoke in a no-nonsense voice. I, I am your first right. I was there when nobody else was, right. Sona's facial expressions were still that of her usual stoicism, that would be the case if it wasn't for the single stray tear that dripped from her left and violet-colored eye. Issei's eyes widened suddenly as his face showed absolute fear. Running back toward Sona, and to her great surprise, the Citri heiress found herself wrapped in both of Issei's arms. As Sona's eyes were wide with shock, they slowly relaxed after a moment or two as her cheek was against Issei's chest. Gently hugging just a bit tighter, Issei shows a panicked expression. I love you, Sona. You were there, yes, you were there. There is nobody I would rather go to. You have my word, you are my first. Sona nods her head while showing a sad smile. Baka, Issei nods while slowly growing a calm smile of his own. Yup, I am your Baka, Sona Citri. Scene, unknown location. Baka, is this a term of endearment? I do not understand. Ophis was laying on her stomach while both of her hands supported her head as she continued to watch the black and purple orb. NYA, good evening, Ophis Sama. I finished making grilled fish, my favorite. Did you want some? Oh, whatcha watchin'? Kuroka's ears flickered as her head was peeking from a cracked door. Ophis turns her attention toward the door. Raising a single eyebrow, the black dragon god replies. Observing what I think is a mating ritual of some sort. Also, yes, I will eat the grilled fish, that will be agreeable. Ignoring Ophis's comments about the fish, Kuroka immediately pounces from the door and now onto the bed. As the infinite dragon god tilts her head in confusion, the Nekomata proceeds to stare at the floating orb with great interest. After a moment of this, Ophis was about to protest, that was until Kuroka interrupted her. Wow, so you are into teenage rom-coms. Well, this is usually the part where things get juicy, era era. Kuroka then looked toward the usually distant Ophis and then smirked. Wait, don't tell me. You don't know about romance and love, right? Ophis tilts her head as the cat woman clearly had a point. Very well, you will explain these scenes to me in detail. However, before that, I want fish. Bring me fish, Nako. Chapter 39, Sona's Chance, a high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazzle. Chapter 39, An Evening with a Mao. Scene, Yasaka Castle. Walking down the large hallway from the guest bedroom, Issei Hyodo had a deep blush plastered to his smiling face. He continued to touch his lips as he passed multiple rooms with closed doors while remembering Sona's goodnight kiss. Only moments ago, Issei told the Citri heiress how he felt about her which gained him a reward shortly after. Finally, the door at the end of the hallway was only feet from the teen as he suddenly regressed into apprehension. Issei was hesitating about knocking on the sliding rice paper door as he was worried about how he should act around Seraphal. I mean, sure, 
there was that one night we were practically alone together in the school, but this, well, this is gonna be my first night with Milky, with Seraphal. I mean, is she going to be like Sona? No, she isn't a Sunere at all. So, maybe the two are totally different. Yeah, that makes sense. But, still, I am staying the night with Milky Chan from, Milky Spiral. Haha, <laughs> take that, Matsuda and Motohama. Issei was drawn from his thoughts when the door in front of him suddenly slid open with some force behind it. Looking in front of him, his brown eyes met with the blue color of Seraphal's, as the Mao was smiling brightly. She was wearing her signature milky spiral attire however her hair looked a bit damp which meant she must have recently bathed. Boyfriend Kuhn. Finally, it took you long enough. Well, come in, come in, let's get a move on, mister. Seraphal took hold of both of Issei's arms while pulling him into the room. Issei's nervousness was completely replaced by a mixture of awe and envy toward his idol as she continued to pull him into the room excitedly. The room itself didn't look much different from the one he and Sona shared, but Issei did notice that there was a large television with a single comfy chair in front. Are you hungry? Thirsty? Well don't worry, I've got plenty of snacks and drinks for our marathon. Seraphal then pointed toward the comfy chair. I hope you're ready for the special edition and unedited screenings of, Milky Spiral, because I can promise you, ain't nobody has seen this, no, nobody. Wait, Milky, are you telling me that you have the infamous and unattainable, black series, of, Milky? But I thought that was just an urban legend, Issei couldn't contain his excitement about Seraphal's proclamation. The Moa simply made a naughty sign with her index finger while showing a slight grin. Have you forgotten who I am, Issei-kun? Taking hold of both of Seraphal's hands and holding them in his own, Issei showed a look of sheer gratitude as he made his own proclamation. Milky, thank you, seriously, you have no idea how much this means to me. Dear Satan, I get to take part in something legendary. Seraphal's eyes widened a bit as a blush grew on both of her cheeks. Oh, really, well, this is nothing. But, if you wanna make it up to me, I may have a request or two. Of course, that's only if you really mean what you say. Seraphal now showed a cartoon-like sad frown. Issei, while still holding both of Seraphal's hands nods rapidly. Anything you want, just name it. Seraphal's frown now turns into a subtle grin. Yay, you are adventurous after all. Okay, my number one fan, I want you to turn your back to me. Issei tilts his head while looking suspicious. What are you going to do? Seraphal puts on a cute pout. Don't you trust your Milky Chan? Looking deeply into Seraphal's eyes, Issei can't help but melt in her gaze. Yeah, yeah, I totally trust you. Hee <laughs> hee. Seeing Seraphal smile, Issei then turns around. He then feels the Mao's little hands pulling the both of his wrists closer together, behind his back. Then, click, feeling fuzzy sensations around both of his arms, Issei looked behind him, only to see a pair of handcuffs, binding his wrists. As far as the soft feeling, that was due to the purple fuzz that surrounded the shackles. That's right, Issei had his arms held behind his back by a pair of purple and fuzzy handcuffs. Attempting to struggle, Issei wasn't able to get these things off. Milky, hey now, what do you think you're doing? Ha 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 ha, oh, the reaction you just made, ha 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 ha, okay, Okay, just relax and stop making a fuss already. Seraphal then turned Issei back around using her arms until their eyes met once again. Okay, I'll admit it, I might have ordered these from a website. Normally, they wouldn't work well against devils, let alone some humans, normally, he he he. Issei tilts his head while showing a confused look. Wait, was this what you meant by, a request? I mean, it's fine, but a bit of warning would have been nice. Seraphal's grin widens. One of them, yes. Very good, Issei, now you're getting it. Wanting to facepalm, Issei instead shakes his head in defeat. Alright, Milky, so, you've got me handcuffed, now what? Boo, don't be like that. It's like I told you, we are gonna have a marathon. So, get your cute butt over there and sit down on the chair. Meanwhile, I'm gonna grab some snacks and drinks for our show. Seraphal then pointed toward the comfy chair next to the television. I can't eat or drink anything like this, Milky, Issei shrugs his shoulders. 
Sweetheart, don't you spend another moment fretting over such trivial matters. Milky is going to feed you. Now, sit your butt down, don't make me tell you again. Seraphal then proceeds to lightly slap the teen on his behind, prompting him to do as he was told. Scene unknown location, is her intention to torture the boy for information. I don't understand what I am seeing. This is beyond perplexing. Ophis had a pillow in her lap as she was hugging it tightly. Her expression however was still quite distant and stoic. NYA, that's just a cute kink is all. Kuroka spoke with a sense of play in her voice as she looked rather excited at what she was seeing. What is this, kink, you speak of, Nako. Ophis now has her attention on Kuroka. Era, oh my, you're going to make me say it, aren't you? Kuroka also had her attention on Ophis as the Nekomata placed both of her hands against her cheeks as her blush continued. It's a type of fetish that is involved with sex. He he he. Ophis tilts her head and then nods. Yes, sexual intercourse, I know of such things. What I fail to understand is how binding your mating partner can be considered a fetish, as you say. Kuroka nods with a proud smile. It's all about control in a good deal of cases. Believe me, we all have kinks, even if you aren't aware of them at first. I mean, you've been alive since the beginning right? Surely a great dragon god such as yourself must have a few things that, well, you know, tickle your fancy. Tilting her head in the opposite direction, Ophis then nods. Yes, I enjoy silence. Kuroka is now the one tilting her head in confusion. That's not the same thing. I mean, what turns you on? Come on. You can't tell me that you, of all people, are a virgin. Without hesitation, Ophis nods. Kuroka's jaw drops. Oh my, oh dear, oh wow. Okay, then, well, maybe I should explain things in a more, how should I say, simple manner. Ahem, alright, so humans, devils, what have you, well aside from the simple act of, well, he he he, sex, you have other things that can enhance the mood. For instance, kissing is quite a common foreplay. Ophis slowly nods. I see, so you are saying that handcuffs are also used in what you call, foreplay, just like kissing. Kuroka shrugs. Everyone is different. Oh wow, look at what is happening. The cat woman, now points toward the glowing sphere of purple and black. Scene, Seraphal's bedroom, Yakasa castle. Thank you for finally sitting down Isekun. As you can see, I have a TV tray loaded with snacks and drinks. Let's see, what's missing? Seraphal, who is standing next to a sitting Issei, looks around the room with her wide and blue eyes. No, I don't think we need anything else. Seraphal now turns her attention to a nervously smiling Issei. Alright, prepare yourself, number one fan. Seraphal proceeds to slowly and seductively raise her skirt up, revealing a pair of black lace panties along with garters. She then proceeds to place one leg over Issei's lap while proceeding to sit down. Now we see the couple, sitting together in the large comfy chair with Seraphal sitting on the teen's lap. After the Mao made herself comfortable, which flustered the Everling hell out of Issei, she then grabbed hold of the remote and pressed the play button. Just let me know if the cuffs make your arms fall asleep. I can adjust them accordingly. If you are really good for me, I'll change the position where your arms are in front of me. But don't get the wrong idea, Milky is still gonna feed you. Let the marathon begin. Seraphal now bounces up and down in the teen's lap as she grabs a handful of popcorn. Issei's nervous face slowly morphed into an excited one. Alright, Milky, let's do this. Also, if you want to commentate during the show, I wouldn't be opposed to it. It's almost like watching the special edition with the producer or actor explaining behind the scenes stuff. Issei smiled brightly while adjusting his shoulders to get more comfortable. To be honest, this was a nice turn of events so Issei thought. Instantly, a bright and warm smile adorned his face. Seraphal meanwhile was enthralled at how much her boyfriend was enjoying her planned evening. Blushing, Seraphal replies in a very seductive tone. I can totally be your special edition, Issei-kun. Anytime, anywhere, my number one fan. Seraphal turns her head and winks at a mildly blushing Hyodo Issei. Scene, Orc, Kuo, Japan. In a large king-size and four-post bed, we can see a sleeping Rias Gramori. She looks to be resting soundly as a small smile adorned her flawless face. Um, yes, that's how you're supposed to do it. Don't stop, 
my precious pawn, that's an order, hee hee, oh, um, Rias was now rolling around in her sheets with a look of lust as she was clearly having a sensual dream. Unknown to the sleeping devil, something was moving from under the large and canopied bed. At first, nothing could be seen as the room itself was pitch black in darkness, however a pair of glowing and red eyes rewarded any and all suspicion. Slowly, a long and skeletonized neck came protruding out from under the frame of the bed. Attached to such a neck was an equally desiccated head of that same phantom camel from earlier. Approaching its face as close to Rias's as possible, it simply waited while making what seemed to be the sounds of one clearing their throat. Ahem, 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 Rias, ahem. As Rias looked to be rolling her eyes from inside her closed lids, she was instantly awakened by the feeling of something wet and slimy on her face. Wiping this slime-like substance from her eyes, the Grimori heiress managed to finally open them, only to see the ghastly horror that looked straight back at her. Its decayed jaw had what looked to be black and olive-green sludge, dripping onto the sheets. Realizing what had just happened, Rias begins to wipe her face off only to look back at her hands. Indeed, that same viscous mucus-like substance was on her face. Rias, Rias, give me some sugar, Rias, slowly. The rest of this camel ghost made its way from under the bed. No. Rias instantly produced two orbs of destruction and fired them consecutively toward the phantom. Chapter 40. Sona's Chance. A high school DXD fanfiction written by Christopher Zazel. Chapter 40. End of Golden Week. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Sarah Falls Bedroom, late in the evening. Say, ah, for me, Ise-kun as the television continues to play the endless marathon of Milky Spiral Black Edition, Seraphal is now facing Issei, as she is now straddling his lap. She is holding one end of a strawberry pocky stick in her mouth as she leans in toward the still-bound Issei. Ah, um, that's youth. The teen happily had the strawberry end of the pocky stick in his mouth as Seraphal began to crunch relentlessly on her end, making her way closer toward his lips. Then, Kisu. Seraphal had both of her arms wrapped around Issei's bound shoulders as the two locked lips. Scene, unknown location. Oh, come on now, that's such a cliché. Do something original damn it. Kuroka was now hugging a pillow of her own as her face contorted from that of a smile, to that of a scowl. Boo, this is bothering me something fierce, NYA. I mean, you have him all tied up and at your mercy, so why not make kittens then and there? See, if it were me in this situation, he wouldn't get any hockey, not until he made me happy, NYA. Kuroka's scowl slowly turned into an erotic grin. Ophis turned her attention from the glowing orb, to now Kuroka. Tilting her head, Ophis replies. Nako, you approve of the use of restrainment in the ritual of mating. Now turning her attention toward the black dragon god, who was also hugging a pillow, Kuroka softly replied with a deep blush. I can't say that I am against the idea, especially if it serves your purpose, NYA. Why do you ask, are you getting ideas from what we're watching? Without any hesitation, Ophis nods. This time, she looks to be showing a very subtle and hardly noticeable half-smile. Kuroka picks up on this and can't help but admire the infinite dragon's all-out honesty. Okay, Ophis sama I have to ask, is this the first time you've ever had thoughts like these before? Like ever, NYA. Kuroka was hoping to hear anything aside from yes as she had a look of anticipation on her face. To the Nekomata's sad disappointment, Ophis once again nods. Seeing the look of complete ignorance and the slight hint of what could only be a smile, Kuroka couldn't help but see her little sister, Kaneko, sitting in front of her, in place of Ophis. Without knowing, Kuroka reached her arm out and began to pat the Ouroboros dragon on her head. This went on for a few minutes, that was until the Nako devil came to her senses. Immediately, Kuroka backed her hand away while attempting to come up with some sort of apology, however her hand was grabbed by Ophis's. Tilting her head, the black-haired Lolicon moved Kuroka's hand back onto her own head. You may pat me, Nako. Pat, pat, pat. Ophis now closes her eyes and removes her hand from Kuroka's. The scene pans out with Kuroka smiling brightly as she continues to pat the black dragon god on her little head. Scene, five hours later, Seraphal's bedroom. As the early sun begins to beat through the windows, Seraphal looks to be leaning her back against Issei's chest in a slumped-over position. 
Meanwhile, Issei is staring directly toward the television with very dark circles under his eyes. Mindlessly reaching for his opened can of energy drink, Issei takes a swig while taking a look at his wrist shortly after. When did she remove the cuffs? Issei couldn't remember but he did know he felt absolutely exhausted. Seraphal meant what she said about a marathon and at this point in time, the teen shouldn't be all that too surprised about it. Considering this was the Mao's first night alone. With Issei, he figured she just wanted to spend as much of their night socializing, almost like trying to make up for lost time, at least that's how the teen felt about the situation as it were. Realizing that he hasn't felt Seraphal move for a bit, Issei slowly moves his other hand and places it softly on the Mao's head. Milky, pissed, are you awake? Not getting a response, Issei smiled warmly while leaning back a bit more to get comfortable, as he also leaned Seraphal's head in a more supporting position. Well, you just get some rest, Milky. Also, thank you, for everything. Issei then shut his eyes. After a few moments, Seraphal opened one of her blue eyes as her lips showed off a blushy smile. My precious little fan, staying up all night, just to spend time with little ol' me. Well, Rias better watch herself, boo. If she tries to do anything to my Issei, well, best not worry about it for now. No, instead, I am going to take a nap on my boyfriend's chest, yes sir. Seraphal then closed her one eye and drifted off into slumberland. What seemed like only moments later, a consistent knocking could now be heard on the rice paper door. Papa Kuhn, Papa Kuhn, are you in there? Seraphal and Issei both opened their strained and bloodshot eyes. Evil glasses girl told me that you were in here. She had this scary smile when telling me that it would be okay to just walk on in. The screen door then went quiet as the knocking stopped. Kuno, oh is it time for breakfast already? Issei showed an exhausting smile. Seraphal smiled while slowly getting off of her boyfriend while she began to stretch. Hey sweetheart. Good morning, sorry I took up some of your time with Issei-kun. But don't worry, he will be out shortly. Alright auntie, Papa-kun, I'll be in the den. Shortly after, the pitter-patter of little fox feet could be heard, scurrying down the hallway. Well then, Issei, yawn, that was a really fun evening. It went by so very fast. Also, thank you for playing along with me, I had a great time. Seraphal was now twirling the set of purple and fuzzy handcuffs on her index finger while winking. Standing from the couch and stretching himself, Issei looked a bit flustered after seeing Seraphal's gesture. Haha, yeah, well, I doubt there is a man alive who would refuse being handcuffed by Milky Chan. Seraphal places her free index finger toward her chin while looking deep in thought. I am sure there are plenty of girls too now that I think about it. Issei's eyes widened at the prospect of Milky Chan dominating other women. Nervously smiling, Issei pinched his nose to prevent a nosebleed. Yeah, well, maybe we should get downstairs soon. Being super tired, it's gonna make me weak against perverted stuff, Milky Chan. Seraphal turned her attention to a now exhaustedly smiling Issei which caused her to equally return such a smile. You know, you're right. We were up really late so maybe let's just take it easy for our last day in Kyoto. In fact, I have it on good authority that your wife will probably want to spend some alone time with you as well. Issei's brain began to increase in its ability to relay electrical signals as his thoughts wandered toward a few questions. First off, how was he going to maintain his relationship with Yasaka and little Kuno? Was it going to be one of those strange long-distance relationships that mainly consisted of Zoom calls and false promises? And how would that affect the little fox princess? No, now was not the time to panic, instead, questions had to be asked in the near future. Yeah, that's it, I'll just ask. Who knows, she might have something in store that I know nothing about, right? Glass half full, partner. Yeah, thanks to Drake. Scene unknown location. Laying on one corner of the bed was. A sleeping and purring Kuroka. She was curled up against a few pillows as her tail randomly flickered into the air. Meanwhile, still sitting on the foot of the pink and black bed, Ophis sat as she continued to watch the purple orb. Assuming the Ouroboros dragon did not sleep, her face showed no signs of fatigue. Rather she showed almost zero emotion as her grey-eyed stare was constant and distant. Suddenly, the sound of gurgling could be heard, coming from none other than Ophis herself. 
Looking down and at her own stomach, the childlike dragon tilts her head. After a moment of this, she then turns her attention toward a comfortably sleeping Kuroka. Nako, 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 Ophis spoke in an emotionless and quiet voice. Realizing that she wasn't going to wake up easily, Ophis then tilted her head the other way. Slowly, the Lalakon crawled her way toward and next to Kuroka. She then looked closely at the Nako devil's body with a focus on her chest region. Ophis then showed a sudden and hardly noticeable grin. Raising both of her arms, the Ouroboros dragon used her hands to fondle Kuroko's breasts under her kimono. As Kuroka made sensual moaning sounds, Ophis showed a very serious look all of the sudden. Slowly, she lifted one breast and then the other while nodding to herself shortly afterwards. I see, firm yet soft. Pliable texture as well, considering the Neko's reaction, I can only assume the larger, the more sensitive. Perhaps I will ask this question once the lazy cat awakens from her slumber. Ophis continues her observation and Kuroka's moans fill the room. Kuroka finally opens her eyes only to see Ophis playing with her chest. Um, good morning, Ophis Chan. Can I help you with something? NYA. Ophis shakes her head. No, not right now, but after I am finished, I need you to get me food. Kuroka tilts her head while showing a very confused and sleepy face. Scene, Yasaka Castle, Seraphal and Issei can be seen walking down the hallway as the two hold hands. Seraphal had a bright and warm smile as she strutted proudly. Meanwhile, Issei was using his free hand to wipe away the stray sleep sand from his eyes. Once they walked through the corridor and into the dining room, a small and golden colored dart blurred its way from one side of the table and now crashed directly into Issei's stomach. Papa Kun, good morning, mommy made breakfast this time. Kuno was hugging Issei's stomach with both of her little arms wrapped around tightly as Seraphal softly patted the little fox princess on her head and ears with her usual cheerful, milky, smile. Meanwhile, Issei was looking down with an exhausted smile. Morning, kiddo, did you sleep well? Yup, yeah, I slept really well. That anime convention was a lot of fun but it made my feet tired. Thank you for carrying me on your shoulders. As Kuno finally released the tired team, Issei noticed that the room was pretty much empty, aside from Yusaka and Kuno. Issei then looked toward the large table, only to see a very warm and composed Yusaka, slowly sipping a cup of green tea. Good morning, Yusaka saw, such a beautiful morning, ain't it? Seraphal whispers in Issei's ear. Good save. Issei nods while smiling nervously. Yusaka places her cup down and smiles warmly. Good morning, Issei Kun, Sarah Chan. Please, join me at the table. I've prepared miso soup with fried tofu as well as grilled fish. Issei, please sit next to me this morning if you don't mind. Seraphal lightly pushes Issei forward while giggling. Get moving, mister. Go and sit with your wife. Well that's all for now see you in the next part.